How was lunch? Everybody alive? Feeling good? Yes. Good. First thing I want you to do, we're just going to go through a little exercise. Close your eyes for me. And just, it's going to be real brief, a little meditation. Um, close your eyes, 15, 20 seconds. We're going to get through this. I want you to think about the meal you just had. Maybe it was a coffee, maybe it was uh, salmon, maybe it was McDonald's. doesn't matter. Whatever it was, think about what, what you ate for lunch. Um, and I want you to imagine it. How, how does it taste? You know, maybe it was bad. Maybe it was good. But think about that and how grateful you are to have the abundance to be able to eat wherever you want. To your intolin, you're having amazing food. How does that taste? How does it feel to know that you've been nourished by the food you're eating? Hopefully you feel a sense of gratitude for that. Okay, that's it. You're done. You just improved digestion just by thinking about your food, having gratitude for it. So these are the things that we can do without a doctor, without digestive enzymes, without all these things that we are buying at the store and the, and the supplement shops these days. Something as simple as that. Another quick thing that you can do, stand up. You can keep things in your hand. You don't have to put anything down. Just keep things in your hand. It's totally fine. Just stand up for me real quick. And I just want you to do Five air squats, just down, up, down, up, three, four, five. That's it. You just improved digestion again. So all these food sensitivities and all these things about the foods killing you and don't eat that and it's horrible, mostly it's because we don't digest food very well. So these are some of the simple things, little breathing exercises, little movement exercises, Gratitude before, during, after, slowing down, appreciating the meal. So much can be improved just by that one technique. So um, I kind of want to, you know, he mentioned that I, that I have an experiential view on health. And I think this is so important in, in my mind because in a world full of data and Facebook posts and internet experts out there, it gets really confusing really quickly and it's hard to know what to believe. Um, Anybody, just out of curiosity, remember their, the, the day that changed their life for the, for the better? Like the one day that completely shifted their life? Kind of hard to remember, usually. It's hard to pinpoint one. Sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't, right off the top of your head. Mine was very clear. I was 13 years old. I was playing, uh, I think this was like sixth grade or something, and I was on the basketball team. And, you know, I'm hot stuff, right? And I'm, I'm going, and we're, we're in warm-ups, and we're going through layup lines, right? So I go up for layup, jump off my left leg, and I feel this pinch in my knee, very sharp pain. I'm like, what the heck is this? And no big deal. I keep playing, keep playing. And it just kind of, it hangs around. And I, I have no idea what this is, never felt this before. Of course, I don't go to the doctor or anything, right? And, and keep playing on it for a little while. Eventually, I got to the point where I needed to go to the doctor and check this out. So I go to the doctor. And of course, you know, it's booking appointments and sitting in the waiting for an hour and a half and, you know, the whole ordeal, which is just a nightmare. And I get in there and he's doing his thing and he goes, well, you have patellar tendonitis. And I'm looking at him going, okay, and, right? And he basically said, you need to ice it, rest it, et cetera, et cetera. So I do all these things, nothing changes. Complete nightmare and nothing changes. Um, I go back and he, and he ends up telling me, well, it's just overuse. You're going to have to stay off it. Right? And I'm like 13 years old. What are you talking about overuse? And so none of it made sense to me at that point. But I kept trying to follow the doctor's orders, never got better. This ended up sticking with me for 20 years. And that was the thing that changed my life when it comes to health. Because it, 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 I lost trust in the system that they were able to take care of my chronic issues. And it forced me to rethink things. And then in my 20s, I'm, I'm in college at this point, I'm playing college football. Well, actually, I was playing college baseball first and I tore my, my labrum in my shoulder, which ended my career there. So I switched and was playing football in college. And at some point I had this skin issue kind of start to come up, right? And my face, it's oily, it's greasy, it's scaly, um, it's red. And I took off my football helmet um, after practice one time. And I could just feel it. And I scraped across my forehead, three, four, five skin layers, and just chucked it to the ground. It was like wet newspaper, like on glass or something, right? You just scrape it off. And at that point, I'm like, okay, you know, what is this? So again, go to the doctor. And I'm a little less confident at this point that he's going to help me. But 
you know, we'll go and see what I can learn. And again, he says, you have seborrheic dermatitis. <laughs> okay. This time I'm a, my Latin's a little better. And so I know what he said. He said, you have derma, meaning skin, itis, meaning inflammation, and the sebaceous glands produce oil. And so I'm like, wait, you just told me what I told you. Right? <laughs> Oily, red, inflammation of the skin. So he didn't tell me anything, right? So he gives me this, these ridiculous procedures to do, and I follow them, and nothing worked. So again, back to the drawing board. Now, this is about 2000. The internet was just starting to become a thing, right? It was like AOL still, and web crawl, and dial up, and, and some of that. But I was able to do some internet searches. And first red pill, I mean, just completely destroyed everything I thought I knew, right? About finance, about big ag, about pharma, about everything, right? And so I lost complete trust in the system at that point. Do we have any doctors in the house, by the way? I might offend you. Hopefully I don't offend you too bad. Because um, I don't dislike doctors. But I've had such horrible experiences with them in terms of chronic issues. Fantastic things in terms of acute stuff. But um, this was a, a big problem for me. And what I ended up discovering was that I needed to fix my health, and I did a lot of things in order to do that. And things kept piling on and piling on, and I was peeling back the layers and figuring out more and more, right? It was getting rid of toxins, it was going to organic food, it was all these things that we're talking about and hearing about these days, back in 2001, weren't as common, and they weren't as talked about. There was no Facebook, there wasn't even MySpace at that point, right? Maybe there was. Um, but they weren't talked about. And so this was kind of my journey into the health world. This is how I left engineering. This is how I got into health and helping people resolve their issues. Was through my own crap and continuing to dig and dig and dig, figuring out the whole thing is a fraud. And so as I started to work with clients, I figured out more and more, right? They, they gave me new educational experience through them. And at some point it clicked. There's a big difference between resolving disease and building health, right? They, sometimes they don't, it may not seem like a big, di big difference, but it's, it's massive in terms of your, your mental and psychological approach. And this is what most of us are doing, right? We are trying to figure out how to get rid of the symptom that we have as natural or unnatural as we can because we don't like it and it sucks. And if we start to switch that and figure out how can, I, can, how can I build health, then everything changes, right? You go to your garden, you don't think, okay, I need to pick all these weeds, how do I keep the weeds out? You actually want to think, how can I create healthy soil so that weeds don't grow here, right? This is the state in which you want to think about health. And so as I started to unwind this for myself, I, I got new understandings, right? And, and the layers kept coming. And this rebuilding health was the, finally the thing that allowed me to go in a completely new direction with my clients and with myself. And this was another big, big realization, was that I needed to be grateful for my symptoms. And this is a really hard thing when you have rheumatoid arthritis and you can't move, when you have cluster headaches or migraines and your pain is so bad that you do not want to be here. All you want to do is get rid of them. But if you can learn to flip that on its head and be grateful for your symptoms, then you start to shift. And it, the reason is because they're there to teach you something. The body is a vessel from which you can learn a great deal, right? And I, I truly believe that, that disease is the soul's way of grounding the psycho-spiritual imbalance. There's something going on psycho-spiritually that is finding its way to the body and it's trying to communicate to you the imbalance in your life. Could be your mental processes, your emotional situation. Could be stuff that didn't even happen to you, and we'll get into that. Um, it could be the way of your, your living, just on a very basic level. So if you're, if you're humble enough to sort of listen to this, then you will be given great gifts. And this has been represented on this stage for the last three weeks, right? Vision talked about Asperger's and how he was struggling to communicate with people. It, and, but he has this brilliant way of seeing patterns. And isn't it ironic that he built an amazing community that has an amazing connection, even though he was struggling with that himself. So that, as, as awkward as it was trying to figure out how to get through that, was a great gift for him. Jim Quick and his broken brain. Would he, do you really think he'd be doing what he's doing today if his brain wasn't broken? It's the greatest gift he's ever been given. He had the strength and the fortitude to understand that, to, to merge with that and use that to his advantage. Jason Goldberg, 
A lot of extra weight he had to get rid of. That transformation allowed him to get on his path of help coach people through all kinds of life challenges. And then Wampa, one of my favorite stories, if anybody was here in, in his talk, he's talking about cocaine addiction and what that led him to. So he's doing amazing work through the emotional traumas that, because he had to go through that. So these are our greatest gifts, but if we continue to resist them, it will continue to be a struggle for us until we finally get the message, right? You'll continue to get slapped. So this is what we did recently. Vishen mentioned this. We went uh, around the world to, to the world's blue zones and, and other places as well. We wanted to understand, take a new look at this idea of longevity because I think there's a lot of things missing and, and we wanted to figure out what, what was really going on there. Because really, at the end of the day, I, I, I love the work that was done, but it was from a journalistic perspective. It was not really from a health practitioner perspective. So I wanted a, a fresh look on that. And we went around to Sardinia, we went to Ikaria, Greece, and Okinawa, talked to all these amazing people on the stage. That guy in the top right's 105. He was riding his bike around for us. Hilarious, by the way. Best guy ever. He's like this tall. <laughs> Julio is his name. Um, so this is the Blue Zones. Is anybody not familiar with the Blue Zones? If you're not, they're, they're basically these areas around the world where you have high concentration of people making it to 100. So they're making it to 100 in, in an abnormal sort of concentration. And I actually just had, I uh, went down, uh, Michelle Poulon, who was the demographer um, that sort of brought this to life um, from a scientific perspective. Um, he actually lives about an hour and a half away, so I actually went and saw him the other day we had lunch. He's got an amazing castle here in, in Estonia. Um, and we talked about a lot of this stuff. And we've, we've had a lot of conversations. He was sort of seminal in bringing this to light. But these are the nine things that the Blue Zones uh, organization identifies that are unique and special about these places that foster longevity. And I have an issue with every single one of them. I think they are all either, there's some version of wrong. And here's really where I think they should be, in my personal opinion, based on going to these places and what I've experienced in my life. First one, move naturally. I don't know what naturally is. Moving's moving. Um, there's better ways and worse ways, but at the end of the day, people we spoke with weren't moving in a natural way. Their back was all hunched over. They're doing hard work, hard labor. They weren't thinking about this functional movement like we have today. They were just moving. So to me, the real key is consistent and lifelong movement. So when you get into your 70s, 80s, continuing to move at that point, 90s, keep moving, right? So consistent and lifelong. Downshift. Again, I don't think that's good enough these days. Right, right now, we can downshift, go to a movie, we can downshift, we can play video games by downshifting, right? By, by relaxing, and, and that's really not what, what's needed. What's needed is to reduce stimulation. We are way too highly stimulated. In fact, most of us are downshifted, sitting in a computer all day long, hyper-stimulated by all the crap that's coming at us. So really, we need to switch this on its head. And the reason is because this is a new era. This is a new world. So we have to think about this in a new way. So I think reduced stimulation is, is much better. Um, the 80% rule, eh, it's okay. But this idea is that you eat eight until you're 80% full and then you stop. Well, that doesn't really encapsulate the, what's going on. Does that mean eat at 4 a.m.? Does that mean eat at 11 p.m. like we are now? as long as I'm only 80% full? No, we need to get in a more rhythmic style of eating. And this is what all the natural societies do because they follow the natural rhythms of the day. So intermittent fasting and the various things that come along with that um, are, are more appropriate. And we'll kind of get into some of that. Plant slant. This has actually been turned into sort of a vegan thing. And I, not, I don't hate on vegan. I've actually been vegan in my life. I've moved and tried a bunch of different things. As I said, I'm experiential. And there's a lot of people that thrive in a vegan or vegetarian or some sort of plant-based diet, and they are fantastic. But that is not the most important thing as a first step. The first step, local, organic, ideally seasonal. This is where we are going wrong as a society. You can eat all the plants in the world, and if they are full of pesticides, full of chemicals, flown halfway around the world, and you're eating them at the wrong time of day, sorry, not gonna work, right? So we have to switch our thinking. Um, know your purpose. Kind of a weird one. Anybody know what a purpose is? I have like 12. You know, and they shift and they change and uh, it's hard to identify what a purpose is and it makes you feel like you gotta be, you know, Richard Branson or Elon Musk or Vision doing, changing the world. You can, you can have meaning, however, in everything. And the Okinawans are probably the, uh, the best example of this. In, meaning is infused in everything they do, everything. What they're eating, how they're sit, how, what they say before they eat, um, who sits in this corner and who gets to talk or eat first. It's not because it's a sort of militaristic thing. It's, it has meaning. And so the meaning is, is the most important thing, and they all had gratitude. Gratitude for the simplest of things, the water, the food, the connection, the time, 
all gratitude. So that's much more impactful than purpose. And then this is a big one, um, this sort of spiritual belonging, family first, right tribe, sort of community stuff. It's a little weak. Community. What does community mean? Um, in fact, somebody got up on stage, I think when Shafali was here, and said, I don't, I had this kind of weird thing that I didn't really feel like I belong here. And I thought, wow, we got a really like-minded community from your tribe, and yet you didn't feel connected. So to me, it's connection. This is the real thing. Vishen mentioned it earlier. Um, we've had a lot of people, Shafali mentioned that the, the Harvard study on happiness was tied to connection, not community, but connection. Uh, Andy Drish, uh, if anybody was at his talk, literally mentioned connection as the whole basis of his talk, building meaningful relationships, connection, connecting. How do you, get, how do you connect more? And then Marissa Peer, right? One of my favorite things that she talks about is that she, there's this feeling of I can't connect, right? Telling yourself I can't connect because I'm different. It's totally dead on. So connection really is the key, I think, to a lot of these spiritual things and, and family first and right tribe. It's all a connection, connection to family, connection to God, connection to nature. Um, that's really what it is. And then this other one that isn't even mentioned, but we have to say it now, get outside. <laughs> we don't spend a time outside. Um, there's a recent study that showed that kids in the U.S. spend less time outside than prisoners. Yeah. This is a bad, bad trend. And do you think it's going in the right direction? <laughs> it's getting worse. And why do the prisoners go outside? Anybody have an idea? Anybody? Shout it if you know. Exercise. They, they're calmer. There's less fights. There's less issues. They know that if they go outside, they're going to be more relaxed. So we know this with prisoners, but we don't allow this at school and with kids. The Finnish do this. I mean, they have one of the best schools around. So getting kids outside, getting adults outside uh, is big. And this is new. We look back in the, the blue zones. It's not even an issue. They're all outside. But now we're different, right? And then synchronize with nature. Huge one. We've got to get back to thinking about the world around us, how we can integrate with nature in every way. This, this involves being mindful. They didn't have to think about it. That was what they, they were in it. They were surrounded by it. They couldn't escape from it. So they had to learn to integrate. It was built into their culture. And then embrace simplicity. This one's getting harder and harder for us. Everything's getting more and more complex. So just getting back to simplicity, I think, is going to be a huge key going forward. <clears throat> So these are the 21st century challenges that I think are new, that you were not represented in the Blue Zones. We're not represented in any tribes or cultural uh, societies prior to now, essentially. We have toxic chemicals through the roof, artificial lighting, big one, these things, crazy. Yeah, big impact, and we'll get into that. Man-made EMFs. This is becoming a big problem right now with 5G. There's actually a, 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 trying to roll this out in Sacramento, California right now, and firefighters are complaining of all kinds of neurological issues. So people love to say, oh, it's just nonsense, this, you know, EMFs and cell phones. It's very real. And the pow more powerful it gets, we're going to start to realize that. 5G is a disaster waiting to happen. So not an alarmist on many things. This one I am. It's big. And we have to really rethink this. So we'll see what happens with that. But that's a big one that we're going to have to think about. Um, water treatment. They were getting their water from streams. So this is a new one that we've got we to look at. Right now we see uh, drugs, drug residues ending up in your water supply. So you may not think you're on drugs, but you probably are, if you're in the US anyway. Um, Tech-based lifestyle, you know, this is not gonna stop. So we have, to, we have to look at how we're relating to that. Hyperstimulation, as I mentioned, and convenience. You know, sometimes right now, it, the best thing you can do is to avoid the convenience. So instead of taking an Uber, here Uber is really cheap, right? Anybody feel like it's just crazy cheap? Walk, not as convenient, takes a little more time, gotta plan a little bit. May not be the best weather, might be too hot, might be too cold. Walk. That simple thing, you know, at the airport, instead of taking the escalator, carry your, your carry-on luggage up the stairs. It's like, <laughs> just work a little bit, right? So it's just infusing this stuff into your day. Um, but getting rid of convenience is big. So I want to talk about optimizing health, okay? First, I want to kind of deconstruct some of the things that uh, I think are really a problem. And this comes from me uh, working with a lot of clients and figuring out, okay, what do I need to do to get them to where they want to be? And this is autoimmune disease, this is cancer, this is uh, digestive issues, hormonal issues, you name it, right? And I found myself going over the same things with all of them, having to teach some of this stuff. So we'll kind of get into a little bit of that. I do apologize, gonna get a little geeky. I hope you guys are okay with that. 
I, it's, you're going to have to take notes or just skip over it and just remember the good stuff. So, but it'll be a little bit more like a college course for a little bit. So I'll try not to, to make it too painful. Psychospiritual trauma. Number one, no question, hands down. Everybody has it, especially those with clinical symptoms. It is the number one health issue, uh, root cause issue that I find with anybody with, with symptoms. And this took me a while to figure out, right? So as I mentioned with my health, it was peeling, 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 peeling. And eventually I came across, oh shit, <laughs> I got some stuff, right? And as I started to peel that back, things really came to light. And this, this happens over and over again. Um, a lot of it happens in childhood, um, not all of it, but this is a, a big point in our lives where we can get influenced. Um, it happens in the womb, happens during birth, happens right after birth, happens in the first kind of seven years of life. Uh, breastfeeding um, is actually a point where it can, it can start to take hold. So there's all these little things that we got to watch out for. And, and some of us, you know, you don't remember these things necessarily. They're in deep in your subconscious that you really can't access very well. So they're there. Anybody familiar with the ACEs study? Adverse childhood events? Good, nice, we got a few people. So this is a study done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. And originally what they were doing is they had this like weight loss challenge, this weight loss thing. And they, it was fairly successful, and, but they realized a lot of people were dropping out before they finished. And they're like, well, what's going on here? So they took all those people that dropped out and tried to figure out what was happening. And what they realized is they all had these little things happening in their childhood. And I mean, it was abuse, neglect, uh, abandonment, parents that were um, getting incarcerated, you know, these various things that, to be honest, many of us have dealt with, you know? I mean, divorce is 50% in the US in my generation. So this is very common um, to have these things happen. So they were kind of charting a lot of this stuff and they had 17,000 participants when they did this and they noticed some pretty shocking things. And, and keep in mind, this was the first time they'd done this type of a study, so they weren't it wasn't a really spectacular design trying to figure out every little thing that somebody could go through. They were just kind of randomly choosing big things and seeing what would come out of this. And here's what they noticed, that out of 100 Americans, 51% had at least, or had one to three aces and 16 had more. So that's 67% of the population, two thirds, had one or more ace, right, of these events that happened in their life. So, this is pretty shocking. And some of, this, some of these results, right, the one in nine smokes, one in nine are alcoholic, uh, drugs, these type of things, it can be explained by behavior. And they have looked at this. Is it behavior? What's going on there? But there's some other things that, that pop up that aren't really behavioral, right? I mean, you have uh, four or more, or more ACEs has 14 times the suicide rate, two times liver disease. So two times the rate of liver disease if you have four or more ACEs. How do you explain that by behavioral issues alone? Because eventually they segregated this stuff. So you couldn't blame it on alcohol or smoking or anything like this. So they actually separated out the behavioral traits and found that still they had higher rates of these things. And actually, an interesting story, I had a um, client of mine, she, a former client, she just kind of became a friend after that. And uh, she texted me and she said, hey, my friend's got her blood test back and the cra her liver enzymes are crazy high, like through the roof. I said, okay, send them, send them over, I'll take a look, see if I can sort anything out and give her some direction. So she sent the, the blood test and um, that's all that was out of whack. It was just the liver enzymes. And I go through blood all the time and try to find various things and nothing else. I'm like, okay, so it's a, definitely a liver-based issue here. And I was speaking to the, the person that gave me the, the, the blood test. And I said, okay, so how's your drinking? You know, just, just do general sort of questionnaire. And I said, I'm guessing there's some childhood trauma here. Um, probably some resentment, anger. Uh, and she's like, uh, yeah. I said, pretty big? And she goes, yeah. So isn't that interesting? Even through a blood test, you can spot these things and pick them up if you kind of know how to think about this stuff. And so why, why does bitterness end up in the liver? Well, actually, let me, let me phrase it this way. What foods and herbs help support the liver? It's the bitter foods, bitter herbs. So isn't it interesting that we store bitterness according to Chinese medicine and some others, in the liver, gallbladder area, and yet bitter foods help, right? So you can pick up on these things. They show up in, in uh, fantastic ways. And so the, the, the deal with her is that you're not, you're not going to fix it with standard stuff. You gotta get to the trauma, right? So once we were able to do that, things improved. Um, six or more ACEs, you die 20 years earlier than those who have zero ACEs. So trauma is a massive, massive issue here. So this is a big one that we have to look at. Um, one of my favorite people in the world, she's an integrative um, a physician, and she was telling me the story of her life. 
she was abused at 10 years old, um, and she ended up getting, developing rheumatoid arthritis. And she recognized it was through this emotional trauma that caused this issue. And so she worked really hard to get rid of this, to resolve it, and to, uh, to get rid of her rheumatoid arthritis. She, she was successful. And then, I think she, that was in her early 30s. In her 40s, her youngest kid came up to her at 18 or 20 and said, Mom, um, sorry to tell you this, but the neighborhood boy, uh, when we were young, raped us, all the kids. And she's sitting there shocked. And she's like, well, why didn't you tell me? You know, she's crying. And her son says, well, because of this. You know, I didn't want to hurt you. And, of course, that makes her feel even worse, right? She's sitting there like, oh, my God. So she's going through all these emotions. She's kind of blaming herself. And four months of working with her kids and trying to um, gain forgiveness, you know, from them, for sort of leaving them with the neighborhood boy because she was going to the grocery store. They worked through it. Forgiveness came. And then after about four months, she goes to the doctor and she has uh, breast cancer right on her left breast, right over her heart. And she goes, oh, I know where this came from. And she ended up realizing that it wasn't the forgiveness that she needed from them, but the forgiveness from herself. So she ends up contacting the guy who did this. Um, pretty, she's pretty highly evolved. She, she's a pretty amazing gal. And she calls him and says, um, I need to speak with you about what happened 15 years ago. And he goes, I've been waiting for this call for 15 years. So he hashes it out with her, and they come to a resolution. But it wasn't until she was able to forgive herself that the breast cancer spontaneously went away. And a month after forgiving herself, the breast cancer was gone. So this is how powerful these emotional traumas in childhood, later in, in adulthood, can be for us. This is an interesting study that looked at Holocaust survivors, and they noticed gene transcriptional changes. In other words, epigenetic changes. The genes are expressing differently if your parents or grandparents were in the Holocaust. Pretty crazy. So we can inherit these things. And there's actually some research suggesting that we can inherit up to seven, year, seven generations. So it's kind of a weird thing to think about. They've actually done mice uh, studies on, on, on mice, and they would put them through this maze, right? And they'd come over here into this maze and get shocked. Right? And then they would never show that mouse the maze again. Take them out, the mouse would have pups. They'd put the pups through. Never seen this maze, get into that same spot, they noticed their nervous system was heightened, the exact same spot that their parents had been shocked. So, okay, that's interesting. Then those mouse have pups, and on and on and on and on. And they've gone three, four, five, six generations and still notice these effects. And those, those newer, you know, newer generations never got shocked. So they're still remembering this. So we get stored this stuff. We're still trying to figure out how. Is it in the water? Water does hold memory. We do know that. Is it in the fascia, which is mostly water? Is it in the nervous system? Is it in the, the brain? Is it in the DNA? In, in all likelihood, it's, it's probably all over. Um, if, if, you know, going back to Nassim's talk, we're holographic, right? So it's probably everywhere. So this thing, this stuff does come through in, uh, across generations. So this is actually one, a great quote by Regan um, when I was at her talk. And she said, what isn't yours becomes your responsibility to dissolve and heal it. And this is totally true, totally true. So I actually worked with a doctor named Bradley Nelson who does some pretty cool work. And, and um, I was familiar with his work and I was I just kind of chatting with him. I said, hey, you know, let's, let's do some of this. Do some of your magic on me. Let's see what you can find. So he kind of does some stuff on me, and, and uh, he ends up finding like, stuff that goes back 10 generations. And I'm like, come on, you know, like, give me a break. He's like, no, this is actually building up a heart wall in you, which is causing you to poorly metabolize vitamin C. And I'm like, what? And, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Vitamin C is used for soft tissue, like joints and cartilage and tendons and skin and all these things. So I'm like, oh, it's possible. So he does his little clearing work, and sure enough, some of the symptoms that I had remaining symptoms got better. So weird stuff. This stuff is be beyond bizarre. But as you continue to look, again, you have to be willing to get to that point to continue to look for this stuff, and you'll find some amazing things. Circadian rhythm disruption. 
Anybody done any work to improve circadian rhythm and this type of thing? Good, good. It's becoming more and more popular. This is a massive one, and it's, it's becoming a, a bigger and bigger issue, um, and the education is coming with it. But um, for, for those of you who are not from Thailand or this area or this far north, anybody notice your sleep's kind of messed up here? It's just a nightmare, right? And the reason is, is because your, the sun is not setting like it should <laughs> from where you're from, right? So we go through these crazy summers where the sun just doesn't die. It's up all the time, and so you can't produce melatonin. So this is a big one. So this is, uh, this is kind of where we get geeky, so hang on tight. Hopefully you, you roll with me on this. Uh, chronobiology is a, a study of time as it affects the bodily functions. And we have a number of cycles in the body, and we have to pay attention to these cycles. You, you, you know, this is these times that we are producing various physiological mechanisms, right? We have, um, you know, coordination, reaction time. Um, in fact, there's, it's a well-known statistic uh, about the heart attacks. There's more heart attacks between about 5 and 8 p.m. because your blood pressure is the highest at that point. Um, so, so these are very real things that, that we need to take into consideration. Um, you might notice this in sports. If you're a, a sports person, you find that certain teams do well in this time zone, but not in that time zone in the U.S., um, perhaps in, in football over here in, in, in Europe as well. But you can kind of see these things. So it's, it's a big deal. So one of my favorite quotes, um, and this is, it encapsulates the, the whole idea. It says, evolution has installed in us a powerful internal clock programmed to anticipate physiological events based on a battery of entrainment cues, including light, temperature, food, and physical activity. Unfortunately, the infrastructure of today's society and our lifestyle choices have thrown a wrench in our biological clockwork. So it's been warm at night, it's been bright as heck at 11 p.m., right? And because of the sort of slow-moving day, you might be eating later than you normally would. So no wonder your sleep is a mess, right? A little alcohol, a little fun, a little activity. All of a sudden, it's a nightmare, and you're, you're kind of tired all the time, right? Waking up late. It's very common. So we've got to go backwards. We've got to look at the history of lighting. A couple billion years ago, all we had was a the sun. Then at some point, 2 million, 400,000. There's debates on when fire sort of arose, but at some point we had fire. Then we had oil lamps and these type of things. Uh, by the way, this is what the blue zones used like 40 years ago. Still using these, these oil lamps and, and lanterns. They did not have electricity in the 1960s and 70s in most of these places. Then we got the light bulb in 1879. Tesla changed the world in 1893 at the Chicago World's Fair. We now have lighting. It wasn't the end of the world, it wasn't too bad. Um, all the way up until about 1980, in the US anyway, when we basically switched over from incandescent bulbs to the compact fluorescent light bulb. Disastrous. All for the saving of energy. And I was, used to be an energy efficiency engineer. It's nonsense what we did. The heat that those were producing actually were beneficial in the winter. <laughs> they're, they're heating the space. So we're not really saving energy, it's just coming from a different place. So it's, it's kind of nonsense, but that changed the world in a way that we have to sort of go back and rethink some of this stuff. And then 2000, we're getting these newer light bulbs that are more white than ever before, more, more blue, and we'll get into what that means. So you can see that the daylight, a lot of light when you go outside. In fact, it's called the lux, right? This, the, the, there's a lot of light when you go outside. And your eyes and your skin notice this. And then you have the incandescent. Look at all that red. That's, that's the energy that we were saving, all that, that red and infrared. It's like, okay, great. So we took that away and we got the fluorescent. Now look at our light. So if we, for four billion years, had the sun, and now we have that, what a nightmare. This is screwing with your biology in a big, big way. We have to take steps to, to fix this. For now, on our own, as the lighting changes, we can start to incorporate these things. Uh, but the cool white LED, see that massive spike in the blue? That will disrupt your sleep so fast. We've got to address this. So this is kind of a, a good representation of Tallinn right now. Um, when the sun's high in the sky, it's sort of blue shifted, right? It's, it's a, a higher Kelvin. You have more blue and green light. This is actually the thing that stimulates you upon waking, and then during the day, if you're getting enough light, actually helps you shift into melatonin production. Your brain actually gets signals to start to go into melatonin mode, and then when the sun starts to set, gets below a certain point in the sky, the blue actually and the green get radiated back into space. So now your eyes are only seeing like fire colors, right? 
This is the way we've been for most of, of existence. This is how all animals in nature would behave. So this is what we want, but most of us who live inside don't get this at night, right? We get this sort of screens in our faces like that. <laughs> Complete nightmare. So this is part of the reason why all of our kids have ADD and ADHD and they're sleeping poorly and they aren't doing as well on tests and they are increase in body weight. All these things are happening because in part, the lighting is so screwed up and it's becoming even more and more complex because the, the lighting is so much sharper and stronger today. Anybody remember like uh, cathode ray tube TVs? <laughs> you had to go up and like turn the channel. Uh, it was artificial, but it, it wasn't nearly the power that these backlit LEDs that we have now. So, so it's much more powerful and it's disrupting our sleep in a big way. So how does this work? The light goes into the eye, right? Hits something called the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right? It's just this thing on top of a nerve in the brain. Tells sort of the master clock. And this is important. This, this master clock dictates what goes on in the rest of your body. So molecular clock, clocks throughout the body, not just the brain, keep tissues humming. You have clocks all over your body. The master clock's in the brain. It's telling and talking to the other parts of your body, talking to your liver, going, oh, hey, it's this time. And the liver goes, no, it's not. <laughs> I just ate, you know? Then, so your, your whole body's talking. And if, we, if, the, if the light up here is broken, not working, everything is going to be off. And how many people traveled here from more than like four hours away, four time zones, or four, four hours in time zones? Yeah. Notice a little jet lag before and after? This is exactly what you're experiencing. Your brain and your body's on one time, and you land in a different time. Your brain goes, whoa. This is not what I expected, right? So this is how this all works. One of the mechanisms is light. It's probably the most important. Temperature, food, exercise, these are the other ones that you want to get right. But I'm, I'm trying to sort of get into sort of the clinical education here to show you that this is not woo-woo science that we're sort of just fluffing around. This is deep, deep biology, and we understand the mechanisms now. So if you look at something like testosterone, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, adiponectin, insulin, a lot of people, we're getting all these tested, right? Some of us saying, oh, my insulin's out of whack, or hey, I've got low testosterone. Um, all these things that are happening, and we're trying to fix them. I've had so many clients come to me with their hormone in, just completely in a tank. Fix their circadian rhythm, everything comes back online. Ah, it's easy, free, you know, very simple. So we, it, this isn't something that's kind of minor. This is a fundamental thing. Things like cancer, if you're, try, if you're battling cancer, this is something you have to get right. In fact, we have now have chemo drugs that are more effective at certain times of the day than they are at others. You know, Chinese medicine uses this. It's all kinds of things that we do knowing this stuff now. So it's kind of a complex thing. Don't worry about this. All those little letters and numbers, those are just enzymes and genes. Don't worry about that. Really what we're looking at here is that the circadian rhythm disruption promotes lung tumor genesis. What does that mean? It means you have circadian rhythm disruption, lung cancer accelerates. So we, we blame lung cancer on smoking. Oh, yeah, maybe. But somebody with, that's smoking and has horrible circadian rhythm, cancer faster. So you wouldn't think those two are connected, but they are. And that was really the point that, that I wanted to share is that this stuff that you may not think it is, is at all related is very related. Here's a thyroid one, big, big issue in the States, big thyroid problem. Um, everybody has thyroid issues these days, especially women, and it's, it's becoming a big, big problem for a lot of women. And what this is showing is that at 9 a.m., you have 458 thyroid-related related genes turning on and 557 other thyroid-related genes turning off. And at noon, you have like 47 total. <laughs> so this is a big shift in how thyroid is functioning, and it's based on time. So if we want to improve thyroid function, as well as any other organs function, we gotta get our timing right. So it's, it's, a, it's a big, big issue. It literally dictates the way your genes get expressed. So this is a cool shot. It's actually beautiful. I love, I love this shot. But it's also didn't exist prior to 1893. <laughs> this is kind of an issue right now. Um, you can imagine how much lighting, how, much, how many sleep issues this is causing. So here's the U.S. Um, the the light-colored states are the states with the worst sleep. In other words, the, the, the least number of people getting more than seven hours of sleep, getting that, that seven-hour mark. And the, the darker states are states that, you, that are getting, you know, higher percentage of people are getting more than seven hours. So, okay, I thought, well, let me overlay these two. You find a, almost a perfect correlation. The only outlier there is Nevada. Anybody? 
can take a guess why that is. <laughs> Anybody from Vegas? Yeah. So, but everything else is pretty much lines up, right? So this is showing you that light in and of itself is a pretty strong correlating factor in how well we're sleeping. So this is, I, I spoke at AFEST and kind of gave a little 90-minute uh, talk there, and I focused on this as well there. And um, one of the gals there was kind enough to email me, and uh, she said, I sleep much better, more deeply, and I have loads of energy during the day. You know, she's saying all these amazing things, and this was three weeks after AFEST. She lost five pounds, all these things, all these beautiful things just by implementing some of the circadian rhythm stuff that I'll kind of get into and telling you exactly what to do and how to, how to implement these things, because it's so simple so simple. You just have to kind of take those first steps. So this is another big one, lack of natural light. So circadian rhythm is one thing, meaning we have to cycle with the, the day and the night, the dark and the light, but we got to go outside and get natural light. It's not a luxury and it goes way beyond vitamin D. We have to get out there. Dark skin people got to get even more. I have had a lot of dark skin clients and I'm like, you can deal with these better just because your skin is able to handle it but you gotta get more sun. Me, I don't need much sun. Pretty quick to, to do what I need to do, but this stuff harms me more. So it's a trade-off, but we have to recognize that we gotta get outside more. This is a cool study. Uh, environmental light exposure is associated with increased body mass in children. Say what? Our kids are getting fatter because of light. They're getting thinner because they're getting outside. So we get our kids outside a little more and all of a sudden, their metabolic fitness changes. They get back into a state, uh, and this is a young kid. I mean, kids are supposed to be kind of fat and chubby and carry a lot of fat, and that's a good thing when they're young. But as they get into the six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, they, they should be in better shape than, than what we're seeing, at least in the US. It's becoming a big, childhood obesity is a really big problem. And this goes into adulthood too. I've had clients that they start doing some of these things and they just start shedding weight. It's crazy. And it's, primarily because their hormones are coming back online. And if there's any bodybuilders in the house, probably not, but anybody ever toyed with that or knows that arena, it's all about hormones, right? Getting cut and building muscle, it's all about hormones. So hormones change this. So this is a cool one. Kids who get more uh, sunlight, less likely to need glasses. So I had a, I had a client um, who came to me for all kinds of, she was 54 or so, came to me with all kinds of metabolic issues, wanted to lose some weight, had some uh, immune system problems, food intolerances, et cetera. So we worked through a lot of this stuff. She, and she, to her credit, I mean, she did it. She was like on point, did everything that I, that I, that I asked her to. And she comes back and she goes, it's kind of weird. My, I feel like my eyesight's improving. And she had glasses. Um, and she's like, I, but I can finally see, without my glasses, I can see my phone from an arm's distance. She said, it's been like 20 years since I'm able to, to see something at that, that distance. So just by getting outside and getting light in her eyes, she was able to improve her eyesight at 54. And most optometrists and ophthalmologists will tell you sunlight, UV is bad for your eyes. I think there's a few years in our timeline that would argue with that. We kind of need that stuff. The myopia boom. China's having a big problem right now with um, nearsightedness uh, because industrial society based on tech inside they're looking at screens right here and they're not getting outside. So we need to get outside with some of this stuff. Implications of light pollution and Parkinson's disease. You can see all these studies, these are real studies. Um, and, and this is a big one on the bottom. Circadian rhythm governs damaging effect of UV light. Everybody thinks the sun's gonna kill them. Sunburns are bad and skin cancers and all these things. The reality is, is we've been outside most of our lives throughout human history. And now we are afraid of it like never before, with a bizarre relationship with the sun. Fix your circadian rhythm, you can actually start making the skin proteins that allow you to absorb the light and deal with any of the harmful effects that too much sun might give you. So there's a lot we can do. And, and this, is, this is a big one. And there's a, kind of a lot going on here. I'll just break it down. Um, you can start with kind of the two yellow lines. That's from 1890. Uh, males and females born in 1890. What, the, the, there's two takeaways here. One is, is that females always have more melanoma, invasive melanoma than males in, in the every time period. So that should tell you it's probably hormonally complex, right? So if, if the sun was causing melanoma, invasive melanoma, do we really think women are spending more time outside than men in such a significant rate that, especially back in 1910 and 1920, men were probably outside more doing the labor 
or it was the same, right? It wouldn't be meaningful difference. But now what we're seeing as you look at to the graph to the left, these younger people are climbing up the curve faster. In other words, by the time they get to their older age, they're going to have skyrocketing rates. So over time, we're getting more melanoma. You guys think we're using more sunscreen now than we were in, in the 1940s? Or were we using more sunscreen in the 1940s? Probably not, right? Way more now. And yet we have more skin cancer. So this is, it's not a, it's, it's not a sunscreen issue. This is a get outside and get light in your eyes and on your skin issue. And the more we do that, the less melanoma rates we have. Your skin is designed to absorb light. You have infrared, you have visible light, and ultraviolet. You can't see ultraviolet and you can't see infrared. You can see the rest, right? So the ultra, ultraviolet is very powerful. It only goes in the first few layers of your skin. This is why we tan. Ultraviolet A is what gives us that tan. When we get into the infrared lights and the, and the longer wavelengths, they penetrate deeper than the skin. Your skin is picking up these frequencies of light in various proteins, keratin, um, uh, melanin, uracanic acid, all kinds of things are picking up these light. Amino acids like tryptophan and tyrosine, all these things, they're literally absorbing these light frequencies and doing things with them. So we need this light. We are built for this light. We have learned to harness this light. We are a photosynthetic machine. It's amazing. What you're seeing on the left there is hemoglobin in the blood. On the right, chlorophyll. Chemically, they're almost identical. Only thing that's, you know, the main difference is that in, in hemoglobin, you have iron in the center, that Fe. And on the right, you have magnesium. So very, very similar aspects here. And this little benzene ring, this little star-shaped thing that's called the benzene ring, is, it's, it's a little hexagon, actually. It's designed to sort of capture, for whatever reason, it captures light really, really well. We see this in crystal structures. We see this in water. We see this in, in these things like chlorophyll. It captures light really, really well. So, steroid hormones. We need things like testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, estradiol, all these things, right? We need these hormones. I had a client come to me in, in uh, the 29-year-old Canadian Special Forces. I mean, fit guy, had a little, like, just a little thing on his stomach he wanted to get rid of, he was sort of frustrated with. Um, but other than that, I mean, he's a fit guy, exercised well, ate well. Uh, but he came to me and said, I have this little extra belly fat I want to get rid of, and I have, uh, I sleep poorly. So I said, okay, well, um, what's going on? And we had to analyze this, and I realized he had horrible sleep because of his circadian rhythm. So we fixed that, all of a sudden, his testosterone starts to improve. We tested him a couple weeks later, he was good. But the funniest thing was that three days in, he goes, he emails me, he goes, dude, I'm getting tired at 9.30. Is that normal? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. He said, like, okay, all right, all right. I said, go to bed. Uh, so then he goes to bed. He, he, two days later after that, he emails me again, and he goes, dude, my dreams are crazy vivid. What the heck's going on? I'm like, you've been sleep deprived for months. So just by changing this stuff, all this stuff comes back online. He loses that little belly fat. His testosterone shoots through the roof again, right? Sexual drive improves. He's loving all that. And his wife's loving that. So it just improves everything, right? <clears throat> so how do we optimize? Kind of showed you some of the big problems. How do we go forward? So one of my favorite quotes, and this is a huge realization in the evolution of your health. As soon as you can understand this as a practitioner or as a, as a client or student of your own health, the, the better you'll do. The art of, of, of medicine consists in amusing the patient while the nature cures the disease. Your body's designed for this. It's been doing this since you were born. You can't do anything more than your body can. Meditation, big, big thing that I probably don't need to spend a lot of time on. I'm sure a lot of people here do some form of meditation. If you don't and you've been wanting to, here's just another reminder and another excuse to do it. The cool thing is, is that we're starting to get into biophysics now with meditation. And we're starting to see um, this, these biophotons, this ultra-weak emissions of biophotons that you actually don't want to release light. I know it's sort of maybe a misconception in the spiritual world that we want to just radiate light, um, which may or may not be true, but you have energy and that light energy is stored in your body for a reason. You actually need it, use it. And so what they've noticed in studies is that you actually lose less light when you meditate, when you slow things down. And we think we know why, but it's not totally elucidated. But definitely a cool thing that I've noticed with, with some of the meditation research is that it's starting to get into actual biophysics. Um, intention. 
set an intent to heal. This is probably a, the biggest one as you're starting on your own, on your own journey. And I think the, the thing that I find most, um, that many people get wrong is that they, feel, they, they get in this mindset of, I'm gonna, I am going to heal, I'm going to heal, I'm going to heal. I'm like, no, you're healing now. There is no going to, right? If you put it into the future, it will stay in the future and you will be chasing it all the time. As soon as you ground it into the now, your body's healing now, you start to heal, right? This is Bruce Lipton, this is Joe Dispenza, there's uh, Lynn McTaggart, there's all kinds of people that talk about this type of intention, both for yourself and others, and it's massive because it now gets you into the mindset of doing the things that you need to heal. The ple and the placebo effect, this is, I mean, so powerful, right? We, it, it's really funny how we kind of throw the placebo effect away. We're like, eh, it's just a placebo effect. That didn't work. I'm like, Oof. that's everything. It's so powerful. We have to literally wash it away and make sure we don't, it doesn't, you know, screw up our, our clinical trials, right? Placebo-controlled trials. So placebo is massive. So work and use that to your advantage, both as a practitioner and for yourself. Mahash Maharishi effect. Anybody familiar with the Maharishi effect? Yeah, good. It's a cool effect. It's been replicated a number of times. We don't really know exactly how it works necessarily. People have theories, but very, very real effect apparently, because this has been replicated a number of times, and it's even been looked at from HeartMath Institute. Right? Um, HeartMath Institute looks at coherence, global coherence uh, initiative, I think is what they call it. They're looking at how the heart and the brain and consciousness uh, connects, how we're all connected. And they're actually measuring this. They're using scientific uh, instruments to measure these things around the globe, and they're finding some pretty cool stuff. So all the data is coming in to suggest that this is a real thing. Another example um, of the improved international relations, lowering of crime, in, in various regions. So it's just a cool, cool effect that we can, we can leverage. What is it? What is it? <laughs> Sorry, I should have explained that. It's, it's, this idea is that you get a number of people, like in this room, and that's sort of what I'm hinting at in the, in the photo there, with all these monks meditating together. When you get everybody in, in, in one location, they, they estimate that it's about 1% sample size of the general population that, to affect the population that is all meditating um, or sending an intention on love, compassion, gratitude, empathy, you know, these, these sort of positive things that will shift the consciousness of that population. So as, you, as we all in this room meditate, however many there are here, can affect a larger group of people outside this room in a positive way to lower stress, lower crime, people that might have been angry before aren't as angry, these type of things. And so you can look, up, look this study, these, this effect up, and you find a lot of cool things. You know, they've done it in Washington, D.C. They've done it in a number of cities, and it's kind of a cool thing. Um, this is Orestes Portelos. He was in uh, Greece, one of my favorite guys. And uh, he, <laughs> after we got done interviewing him, he said, you know, when I was young, the body was busy and the mind was still. The problem today is that the mind is busy and the body is still. I'm like, dude. <laughs> movies end, like that's it, done. That's all we need, right? That's kind of all we need to know right now about the, the problems that we're having. So we just need to slow the mind down and, and, and sort of disconnect on occasion. So this is, this is sort of the protocol that I tend to give my clients to restore their circadian rhythm. Um, it can be tough in a place like this, uh, but, but you know, in, when you get into a more natural rhythmic setting, wherever you're coming from and go back to, if you can start to implement these things, um, good things will happen. Um, you, the idea is that you want to get daylight in your eyes and on your skin as much as you can, especially first part of the day. That sets the cycle, sets your clock. And then as the night comes, the sun sets, you want to reduce the light, you know, become comfortable with the darkness, candles, fires, red light bulbs, orange light bulbs, these type of things. And you really do start to notice a difference. I've had many clients fight me on this and eventually they give in and then they go, oh my God, it's so peaceful, it's so nice. I'm like, yeah, this is, you, just, you should do it. <laughs> and they fall in love with it. Intermittent fasting, um, we didn't really talk much about this other than sort of comparing it to the 80% rule. But this is, this is a big one. There's a lot of ways to intermittent fast. But the idea is that you want to keep your food window, the, the time that you're eating food, into sort of a normal period. So whether that's 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., you know, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., whatever it is for you that works, 
Use this to your advantage. You can go on longer fast too. Uh, very effective at, at, to solving a number of, of uh, health issues. So I think Ben Greenfield mentioned this perhaps on, on his talk uh, when he was up here with Vision um, the other day. Proliferation of stem cells as well. So I know that's something Ben, ben is looking into. This is, this is all there. So it, it has a number of effects. And this is a trick for anybody that, that wants to, that's into products and hacking and this type of thing. Uh, molecular hydrogen is a fantastic tool um, to uh, reduce all kinds of symptoms. This has been studied mostly in Asia. There's thousands of studies on this. And it's still, it's just kind of now starting to come up, but it is super, super effective. I've been using this myself. I use it on a number of clients. There's, unless you have cancer, I would, I would hold that aside because you actually want some cell death to happen in cancer. But almost everything else, it is highly effective. And there's virtually no risk, as this study actually highlights. Neurofeedback, emotional freedom technique, meditation, these are things that we can use to deal with the traumas. Family constellations, these are, these are popular now, gratitude or forgiveness journals, plant medicine, entheogens, I've had some experiences there. Um, the first probably main powerful tool that I used was Vipassana meditation. I went on a retreat, I still had some pain in my knees and you know, you're meditating 10, 12 hours a day at these Vipassana meditation retreats. And I'm sitting there in a meditation pose, my knee is just aching, right? It was terrible. And eventually, you know, I, I've got to move it. You know, 45 minutes in, I'm sort of getting, getting the pain out. And then a third, fourth day, um, using Vipassana meditation techniques, the pain starts to dissipate. And I'm like, oh, this is weird. I can sit here now, no pain. And by the 10th day, my knee was probably 60% better than it was when I came in. So this all has to do with subconscious and letting this stuff go, not holding on to it. Plant medicines are uh, extremely effective um, if that's your route, um, if that sort of intrigues you. Um, I've had really good experiences with that as well. Um, and ultimately working with a practitioner. There's, there's a lot there that needs to come up and working with a practitioner can really, really help. Um, Shinrin Yoku, this is a phrase in Japan that they use, it just means forest bathing, getting outside, going into nature. This is crazy, I mean, this changes your neurochemistry, your neurobiology, your neurotransmitter shift, your mood improves, uh, brain plasticity increases. All these things come from just being outside, looking at nature, being in nature. Um, and to, to a smaller degree, even looking at a photo of nature has this effect. So this is a pretty powerful, powerful thing. And it improves the, the parasympathetic tone, the nervous system to get you out of this fight or flight into a more rest and digest. All these things can really improve um, the, any health issue you're dealing with. Um, sauna therapy, infrared light absorbed by water used as a, in your cells as a battery. Um, you're sweating out chemicals like glyphosate and these metals that are all, we're all dealing with now. So this is a, a very powerful tool, increases heat shock proteins, making you more resilient. There's lots there um, that, that saunas can do for you. Cold thermogenesis, I know a lot of people were looking forward to Wim Hof, um, who's one of the best guys ever. Uh, he's sort of popularized this, which is a really good thing, because um, we don't have these temperature exposures anymore. And so just getting into the cold is very, very effective um, at improving cold shock proteins, making you more resilient, improving uh, the fat that we have. The, well, the white fat turns to brown fat. It's more metabolically active, becomes more like an organ. There's all kinds of things that happen when you, when you experiment and use these, these techniques. And this is a big one. Um, Dorota, uh, on her talk, talked about creativity. Um, and how to sort of harness that, how to get into that creative mode. Um, this can be actually used for your health too. Um, one of my friends who's a practitioner, she in her 20s uh, was dealing with sort of endometriosis and some um, reproductive issues and fallopian tubes and all these things that were going on and, and she didn't know what it was. And it turns out she had a, a mass growing eventually. She went to the doctor, um, had a mass growing and they said, okay, here's, here's the situation. So, being that she was into nutrition at that point, she fixed her nutrition, exercise. She worked with energy medicine uh, stuff. She worked, literally did everything she could, wouldn't help. And she's been doing art and uses her art and, and she's painting all this stuff and she, she just felt like doing art. And eventually she, she had a showcase and her boyfriend at the time, who's now her husband, looked at it and said, I think you're painting your fallopian tubes in your uterus. And she kind of stepped back and she's like, huh, you know, they're just circles, it's abstract, and it's eating orange and red and all these things. And sure enough, she realized that's exactly what she was doing. Her health issues were coming out of her and being expressed through her art. And she didn't even realize it. 
And so she leveraged that. She, she kept doing her art and using these, these sort of colors. And she went back to the doctor a couple months later, and n- nothing there. It's all clear. Doctor acted what she's been doing. She's like, I don't know if I should tell her. She's not going to believe this. She goes, well, I've been nothing. I've just been doing my art. Everything else has been steady. And the doctor said, okay. That's all she needed, right? Very simple, but um, pretty amazing how art, and, and it, can, it can be anything, play, you know, dance, um, song, uh, whatever it is for you, even, even things like math and, and, and more, um, you know, numbers side of things can, can really be effective um, in, in healing. So this is kind of the equation that I've uh, ultimately decided on um, in, in sort of health and longevity, is this idea that um, you, you, have, you have the repair and replication side of things, and then you have this hormesis, this idea that you're stimulating something to make it stronger, right? This is what we do with exercise, this is what we do with light, um, fasting is this way, um, some of the plant chemicals that we get are actually stressors on the body that help us um, exhibit a resiliency response. So when you combine the repair and replication aspects of life with the hormetic effects, and you reduce, uh, that's supposed to say, not repair and replication, it's a copy and paste error, uh, but the biological destruction mechanisms, right? So this biological distress. So you want to lower the biological distress, and this is trauma, chemicals, artificial light, all those things that we kind of talked about. So that is, in essence, how you improve your health um, across the board. And this is probably the most important thing, is that you're here right now, right? And instead of thinking about the future, um, what your health is going to look like, Enjoying the day is probably the most important thing. Um, I had a friend of mine that I interviewed. He's a professor at the University of Michigan. And uh, he works with purpose and this type of thing. And he had a daughter at six months had an issue in her heart, a virus that actually impacted her heart. And um, it was so bad, she needed a heart transplant. And so this was, nobody had ever done a heart transplant on a six-month-old child. And they were lucky enough to be able to get this done. So she was the first person to receive a, a heart transplant at that early age. And it was successful. And the doctor said, well, we don't know how long she has. Literally can be any day. We've never done this. We don't know. So imagine receiving that message as a parent, right? You have a daughter. Tomorrow might be her last day. Or today might be her last day. So what do you do in that scenario, right? Right? I mean, I think he, for him, the, he, instantaneously, it was him and his wife thinking, like, what, how do we form a life on, like this? You know, is, is it not to enjoy each day? So they made a decision at that point to enjoy each day. It doesn't mean going to Disneyland and doing all these things. It meant being in full gratitude for the time that they get to spend with their daughter. And the crazy thing is, she ended up hitting 10 and 15 years old. She went to college and did uh, nursing. She wanted to help people, and so she became a nurse. And I think they were down in Florida at their spring break, and it was, it was uh, her do- uh, his daughter and her sister and her daughter's boyfriend, and they were all down there in Florida. And she's just an absolute delight. She goes, I- I'm so happy. I could, I could die right now and be fine. And those were her last words. So her dad talked to her boyfriend the next day and didn't get to hear from his daughter. So, I mean, I don't know about you, but if somebody can get to that point at 19 and think, I lived a great life, I'm happy to be here, probably a good idea to sort of step into that if we can. And for him, that changed his life, obviously in a way that was so profound that he began teaching this stuff at the university level. So as soon as we can step into the space of gratitude in the now, being grateful for being here despite any health challenges, despite any emotional problems, what happened to us in the past, and just be here, that is where we want to go. And you know, if you talk to some shamans, they will tell you that if you are truly present, it's impossible to be sick. All sickness comes from the past or the future thinking about the future. So the more we can step into the now, the more we avoid health issues as they come, and the more we resolve the health issues that we might have. So I'll kind of leave you with this, you know, and and suggest that the more you surrender to the process and let go of expectations, the faster these things 
will just fade away and melt. So let go of trying to become and instead come to be. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>